is a program director of Master of Art in Religion program. And the title that we'll be presenting is Religious Pluralism and its Implication to the Authority of Scriptures, Identity and Mission of the Church. And I want to remind you that at the end of the presentation, we'll give you time to ask questions. So you can ask questions, of course, uh, related to the topic. So now I would like to welcome Dr. Tornalejo to please uh, come forward and present the paper. Thank you, Felix. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm happy to see my good friend, Dr. Uh, Connie from the UTS. Would like to, even though you were welcome already, I would like to give a special welcome to you and your team. I'm happy to see you this morning. And uh, I would like to extend a personal invitation to your team as well to come to IAS and present your papers for the next forum. And also some have asked me a question regarding the deadline of the proposal. The proposal's deadline is on the last day of July, but the paper, full paper, is expected to be submitted on uh, October 15, so you still have time. And I'm also happy to see my good friend, Dr. Hazel, uh, Pastor Hazel from Andrews. And uh, uh, please uh, extend our invitation also. Maybe we'll send you some official uh, invitation to Andrews to come and present papers for the next uh, coming forum, the IAS Annual Forum. This morning, I am reading a paper about religious pluralism. And uh, I'll do this quickly so that you can have questions later. Thank you, Felix, for giving the necessary correction. I see in my uh, uh, title there as a professor, but uh, I want to correct that uh, uh, rendition to give an accurate, not a fake news, huh? that I'm an associate professor to be a legitimate title. Thank you. Pluralism is complex and a tricky word in modern discussion. One could agree with D.A. Carson that to some, Pluralism is positive, while for others, it has only negative connotations. And pluralism becomes even more complicated and controversial when brought into the discussion of religion. There are at least three basic meanings of the phrase religious pluralism, from which all other definitions and other nuances may hint. And so from pluralism, I would like to zero down to religious pluralism, and in spite of the religious pluralism phrase, it has still embracing connotations, and I would like to zero down on three basic meanings, which may uh, hinge all other nuances and meanings. First, religious pluralism could mean religious diversity. Second, religious pluralism involves interreligious dialogue. Pluralism in this aspect holds that to one's own faith and at the same time engages other faiths in learning about their path and how they want to be understood. And pluralism and dialogue are the means for building bridges and relationships that create harmony and peace on our planet home. And third, Religious pluralism could mean accepting the equal validity of other religions. Take note. Religious pluralism could mean accepting the equal validity of other religions. And this assertion is built on the premise that none is certain enough in its particular dogmatic formulations to provide the norm for interpreting Others. And so in the absence of a definite standard, there is no such thing as right and wrong. Simply said, all religious or all religions are equally legitimate and valid, for there is no absolute truth. And religious pluralism is in the context of equal validity of all religions, is interconnected with the various forms of universalism, a notion that could be traced to origin. And essential to this concept is the form of universalism that finally, in the final end, no human being shall be lost and all shall be saved. In the full paper, you will find footnotes and references to these assertions. 
Primary, the objective of this paper is to investigate the implication of the third definition. So of the three general definitions I presented, I would zero down on the implication of the third definition, which says that this view has religious, or I mean, great bearing on three major tenets held by the Christian church, particularly by the Adventist church, namely, the inspiration of scriptures, our identity, and the mission. And consequently, this study offers a critique of religious pluralism on the third definition's proposition or presupposition of equal validity of all religions and its denial of absolute truth. Emergence of pluralism. Pluralism or religious pluralism has become very attractive in this age of inclusivism and globalization. One must be aware that religious pluralism did not arise from a vacuum. Netland observes that cumulative factors have influenced its rise and its growing acceptance. He writes, the disestablishment of Christianity in the Western societies, the increased marginalization of traditional religion in modern life, and a deepening skepticism about the claims of Orthodox Christianity and the existential awareness of cultural and religious diversity engen engendered by globalization work together to erode confidence in the truth of Christian faith in favor for a more pluralistic alternatives. But mind you, encountering religious pluralism in Asia, to me, religious pluralism is not a Western phenomenon. And if you be aware, that the religious diversity inherently pervasive in Asia has been considered as one of the underlying factors in the rise of religious plurality in the West. Think about that. The Western countries are considering religious pluralism in Asia and began to think or begin to think that after all, we should embrace Western or not Eastern religion. In the West, Speaking the West alone, postmodern worldview. But I know in the East, here in Asia, even though we have not yet grasped the postmodern worldview, religious pluralism is already inherent to us. But in the West, the postmodern worldview that presupposes as truth is relative has been embraced by many. And in the wake of the continuing series of violence, which roots could be traced from religious extremism and intolerance, more and more are looking towards religious pluralism and interdependence as the solution for living harmoniously regardless of having different religious beliefs. I don't know if I'm accurate, but he said, the world wars combined death may not equal to the death caused by religious intolerance. That remains to be backed up. But think about, some said religion is the most intolerant, or religious people are the most intolerant people. And so in the wake of this catena of violence, prompted by religious conviction, people in the postmodern think that maybe it's time to open up to embrace religious pluralism for a peaceful existence. However, religious pluralism has direct impact on the teachings of the authority of scriptures, identity, and mission of the church. Moreover, it touches other major areas of theology, such as concept of revelation, the doctrine of God, Christology, and most especially, soteriology. Pluralism and the authority of scriptures. First, pluralism undermines the divine nature and authority of the scriptures. Christians, much more Adventists, consider the Bible as a divine and human product, yet are fully convinced that it is the infallible word of God. It is the supreme authority in matters of faith and practice. And the scripture is more than a code of ethical conduct that offers a suggestion of the kind of life one ought to live, but the scripture is a propositional revelation and its veracity could not be questioned. 
On the other hand, pluralists vehemently deny the existence of literal truth. And for them, the existence of objective truth cannot simply be established. And if there is any, it is beyond the grasp of finite humanity. And this argument is built on the framework that debunks the divine origin of the scriptures. The Bible speaks about God's transcendence, but at the same time is a witness of God's self-disclosure. It is both of human and divine nature. And here, the rejection of the scriptures as a propositional truth is averred by John Heck, an avowed pluralist, who wrote, I do not think that it is possible to, to settle theological issues with the Bible. The Bible is a collection of documents written during a period of about a thousand years by different people in different historical and cultural situations. And the writings are of a variety of kinds, including court records, heavily edited, slanted history. I'm reading a quotation, by the way. Prophetic utterances, hymns, letters, diary, fragments, memories of the historical Jesus, faith-centered pictures of his religious significance, apocalyptic visions, etc. And the human authorship and historical setting must always be taken into account in using the scriptures. I agree with the last line, but the premise I disregard. More, furthermore, in response to the issue of conflicting truth claims as an argument in favor of the existence of absolute truth, Hick argues that religious truth should not be considered as literal truth, but as mythological truth. Then the issue of absolute truth disappears. In a straightforward way, he said, I quote, I do not believe that God reveals propositional to us, whether in Greek, or Hebrew, or in English, or any other language. I hold the formulation of theology as just a purely human activity that always and necessarily employs the concept and reflects the cultural assumptions and biases of theologians in question. On the other hand, Carson admits the cultural relatedness of the truth, but that this does not jeopardize the objectivity of the revelation God has graciously provided in His Son, Christ in the Bible. That there are always or ways of thinking through how people come to know this truth and the Bible, who is its ultimate source, and that failure to recognize it for what it is, in short, is failure to know God and is morally responsible and marks a rebellion against the authority of one who created us and who governs us. Stressing the same point of an ultimate authority, but from the other end, Netland reasons that one can be entirely faithful to biblical witness and still acknowledge that there is some truth and beauty and goodness in other religions. But these two things are not mutually uh, in agreement. Nevertheless, to concede that there is goodness in all religion does not mean in any ways that all religious truth claims are equally valid. If one adheres to the principle of Sula Scriptura, the issue of absolute authority and the question of its ultimate authority is a settled issue. The existence of truth claim is an argument that runs against the claims of pluralists. As a matter of fact, truth claims is, unique, is not unique to Christianity. All religions, for that matter, in one way or another, claim supremacy over the other. This is not only true again to Christianity, but to all religious claims. Every, I'm skipping uh, some quotations, you can get a full copy anyways later. Even proponents of religious pluralism are not immune to superior truth claims. Carson observes that the perennial problem of pluralism is that it cannot consistently argue its case without succumbing to the kind of authority that it denounces. Religious pluralism denounces absolute authority, but the claim of religious pluralists that all religions are valid is in itself a claim of superiority, even as it argues forcefully that claims to religious superiority is a form of triumphalism. Though not verbalized, it simply means that the claim of equal validity is a claim to other superior truth claims. Again, the argument of religious pluralism stands or fall on their view of the nature of scriptures. Religious pluralism and the identity of the church. 
Second, the assertion of pluralistic worldview that all religions are equally valid flies in the face of the Adventist ecclesiology and its claims as the eschatological remnant. From a, uh, from a non Adventist author, the argument runs this way. One has to wonder what value there is in remaining within a particular religious tradition or even what it means to remain in a particular religious tradition if the essential correctness of the pluralistic hypothesis is accepted by the believer. If everything is true, it doesn't matter where you belong, right? As a church, Adventists have always believed in their uniqueness, not in a soteriological perspective but it, it's missiological claims. The distinctive superiority, others may have reservations in using the term, is not salvific, but missiological. This is find, found, I mean, in the understanding of E.G. White. said God has a distinct people, a church on earth, second to none, but superior to all in their facilities, in what? To teach the truth and to vindicate God's law. And moreover, this assertion of missiological uniqueness is found in the claims of the Adventist belief, fundamental belief, or Adventist belief, page 197. As already stated, the remnant claim of the Adventist church is missiological rather than sal salvific. And the church makes no exclusive, mark that, the church makes no exclusive claim to salvation. On the other hand, the church has no reservation in claiming to be the eschatological remnant. Religious pluralism with its claims to the equal validity of all religions denigrates the eschatological uniqueness of the Christian church, much more of the mission of the Adventist church. Then again, if all religions are equally valid, the Adventist church loses its identity and its relevance. Religious pluralism and mission. Third, pluralism undermines the necessity for mission. Granting that all religions are equally valid and that all religions lead to salvation, there would be no need. There would be no need for mission. On the contrary, we are enjoined to preach the gospel. The gospel is centered on Jesus Christ as the only Lord and Savior of all humanity. And that is why when we do mission, when we do gospel preaching, what is embodied in our mission? What is embodied in the gospel? On the same line of thought, Carson defines the gospel as the good news of God's redemption and the dawning of the eschatological kingdom in the person of whom? Jesus Christ. And the idea of the universal need of salvation implies that all humanity which has fallen into sin needs the atoning blood of Christ. Apostle Paul sums up this human condition and pointed out, for all have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. Netland could not be more correct when he wrote, the Christian gospel thus has elements of both universality and particularity in its core. Universality in that all humankind, including other religions, sincere though may be, they are, are sinners are in need of redemption by God's grace. Jesus Christ is the utterly unique incarnation of God who took upon himself the sins of the world. Nitlan continues that for Apostle Paul, the passion for evangelism is not just propelled by any other, but it is propelled by the conviction of the gospel. So let us rethink of our mission without the gospel. And the gospel is centered on Jesus Christ. For this reason, Netland insists that the same gospel as centered in the redeeming power of Christ should be the foundation of Christian witness in the present day. He adds that the legitimacy and significance of Christian witness cannot be separated from considerations of Truth claims belief about the Lord Jesus Christ. When Apostle Paul wrote that I am not ashamed of the power of the gospel, for it is the salvation of everyone who believes. And we are, I think, no one will argue that belief here as an objective. What is the object of Paul's belief? That is Jesus Christ. So we cannot do away, when we do mission, we will do away with Jesus Christ. Uh, Netland reasons that if the atheists are correct and world evangelization, evangelization is become, has become pointless, if other religions are equally valid, then preaching salvation in Christ is useless. 
Angel Rodriguez, although speaking in the context of the dangers of ecumenical dialogues, echoes the same idea. He observes that evangelism is compromised and mission to other religious groups is hampered when we consider all religions are equally good. He warns that it is tempting to conclude that since all believers are good, we have nothing to offer to them. And that is why, in the context of ecumenism, in 1910 World Missionary Conference in Edinburgh, a consensus was reached that no discussion of doctrinal and theological differences must be considered. In the light of the preceding discussion, one must be aware that the life and ministry of Jesus Christ cannot be dissociated with mission. There is no gospel without Jesus Christ. Likewise, there is no purpose of mission without Jesus Christ. The saving death and the exclusive claim that salvation is only through him, solus Christos, lay at the foundation of the mission of the church. I'll skip some lines. But a relevant question comes into the discussion in mission about the faith of those who never heard the gospel in the name of Jesus Christ. Although it must be confessed that there is no other exception through the name of Jesus Christ as a salvation, it is a realistic sense that all could not have heard about Jesus Christ. That's a reality. There has been the recurrent debate of the faith of the heathen. Rodriguez's insight is quite helpful in resolving this issue when he suggests that mission is primarily God's initiative. He invites the church to be partakers of mission but reminds the members that the mission of the church was and will always be God's mission. Therefore, we are commissioned. Mission did not originate in the church but with God. It has always remained His it is always mission day or God's mission. He argues that before there was a human being, the Godhead formulated a rescue plan for the human race in which its member of the Godhead was to be involved. And this is recognized by the church. I quote, uh, five minutes, I'm aware. Among the heathens are those who worship God ignorantly and those whom the light is never brought by human instrumentality, yet they will not perish. Though ignorant of the written law of God, they have heard his voice speaking to them in nature and how the things that the law requires. Their work are evidenced that the Holy Spirit has touched their hearts and are recognized as children of God. However, the fact that mission is primarily God's work through the Holy Spirit does not excuse or exempt us from mission. Therefore, with this, we are to preach the gospel about Jesus Christ. In conclusion, regardless of the noble objective of religious pluralism to attain peaceful coexistence by accepting all religious belief as equally legitimate, it carries a number of theological baggage to conspicuous to ignore, not to mention the steep price involved. Based on the above study, one cannot endorse religious pluralism without abandoning the belief in the ultimate divine authority of the scriptures, and in like manner, religious pluralism undermines the identity of the church as the eschatological remnant. And finally, the presuppositions of religious pluralism that all religions are validly equal makes missions needless. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Tonal Hill, for the presentation. Now we come to the question and answer part. We have the um, microphone there. And do we have question now? We have only uh, five minutes, around five minutes. So, any question? Okay, it seems that it's already perfectly understood. <laughs> okay, we have over there. Yes, please. Thank you for a wonderful presentation, Doctor. I was asking, uh, 
you say that uh, other regions they are preaching about Jesus and salvation is based in Jesus. So Jesus is the object of salvation. So if they preach about Jesus, we as Adventists, we are also preaching about Jesus. So salvation is, they, do they really, because salvation is based on faith, believing in Jesus. So are we really saying that they, as they do mission, there is something lacking for somebody to gain salvation so that we can over? Are there something lacking? Because salvation is based on Jesus Christ and those who believe in him. And they preach also like that. And that is mission for them. That's their understanding of mission, the understanding of salvation. So we also as Adventists, we are also preaching the same. So what makes us different? Saying that we are really having something better than them. If salvation is based on that issue. Okay, please. Thank you very much, uh, Philip. My uh, paper is not on the issue of salvation, saying that uh, uh, primarily, I think, uh, I don't know if I've skipped that section, we are particularly on the issue of who will be saved and who will not be saved. But uh, take note that the prerogative of salvation belongs to God. I cannot prescribe or I cannot describe or cannot outline who will be saved or not be saved. But your question may be thinking about what is our difference? Well, in the commonality of our Christian faiths, on the essentiality or vitality or primacy of Jesus Christ as our Savior, we do not differ. We are all in agreement. Our disagreement may be on uh, some theological fine lines, but it has something to do with hermeneutics. But if you may ask about the experience of other world religions, I cannot agree with the same claim that they are all equally valid if they find or anchor in salvation not on the objectivity of Jesus Christ. So that is why there is a need for us as a Christian church and particularly as Adventists to do mission. Because based on the authority of scriptures, Acts 4.12, there is no other name that could be bring salvation to all humanity. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, two minutes more. Yeah, please, over here. Hello, hello. Good morning, Dr. Tornalejo. I know where you are coming from uh, with your lecture, but uh, my question is, uh, in dealing with pluralism, for example, if the trajectory or objective of other religious groups is for the wholeness of creation, or in our language, in the biblical language, the kingdom of God or the reign of God. If these other religious groups would promote the reign of God, the kingdom of God, shalom, or the wholeness of creation, shall we not also agree with them, in fact, recognize them, in spite of where we are coming from as biblical people or, or Christians? Uh, that's my uh, thinking. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Reverend. This question is very relevant in the concept of ecumenism. The global aim of all religions is to come into peaceful existence. And as what I have defined in the three definitions offered by uh, Carson and uh, uh, Religious Discovery Guides, that says that religious pluralism involves interreligious dialogue. And so... Uh, it is not uh, forbidden for any religious group to engage in a dialogue 
for a peaceful end. But remember, in the concept of the scriptures, truth claims may come or clash against each other. Truth claims. And so as what I have made in my conclusion, I agree with this noble aim of religious pluralism, particularly ecumenical dialogues and movements, but if it compromises truth, there is a demarcation or a borderline wherein we can limit our religious dialogues. And that is why if we look into, I don't, I don't know if uh, Pastor or Luaya will discuss on this, in the concept of ecumenism in the Catholic understanding, no concessions are made. And so, based on that perspective as well, even though we differ on the different conclusions, we see that the end could not justify the means. If no religious truth claims are compromised in these dialogues and towards the end, no questions. For example, in the approach of ecology, many religions agree on the preservation of ecology, but some based on a different perspective that nature is divine. Nature is holy. And it is a mixture of panentheism. If nature is holy, we have no right to eradicate or to destroy nature. But if nature is in the concept of stewardship that we are given the prerogative by God to preserve nature as stewards, that, this would, that would be a biblical end. But we disagree. Although we have the same end, we disagree with the means. So I agree in some sense that an end of a shalom, the kingdom of God will be established here on earth. But somehow, for example, I do not disagree with the liberation theologians of the concept of bringing the kingdom through other means, not accepting violence. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, I think we can go to the next uh, session. Can we give an applause to Dr. Tonal Hill? Thank you so much. And we can continue to the next uh, session.